Hey guys, once upon a time, more than 10 years ago actually, um, I had this friend and uh, this friend wanted to know if it was God's will for him to go abroad. And uh, the thing is, there was a job offer with three times his salary. Can you picture it? Three times the salary. There's just one problem. There was no church, no Bible study, no Christian group in that place. Would you go? Not a missionary. He's not a missionary. He's not trained to be a church planter. He's not trained to do, biz to do Bible anything. Would you go? It's a very familiar story to many of us, especially in today's world. Uh, the ending of that story is the person left, went there, ended up with a non-believer, started to live together with the person, and the last time we spoke to, the, to that friend, uh, the person didn't know what to do anymore. Felt so much shame, didn't know how to get back to the Lord, didn't know what to do next, and felt depressed. The money was great, but the person said, I'm depressed, I just, the money isn't helping. That is a familiar story for us here in the book of Ruth. Wouldn't you agree? And today, we're going to do an overview. And in this overview, we're going to jump within the book of Ruth. So you don't really have to keep your Bibles open to follow because we're going to keep jumping. I'm going to read the text anyway. Uh, and we're going to choose certain texts, all right? And when we choose certain texts in the book of Ruth, uh, it's chosen out of relevance based on the context of NCC as a local church. This is what we call task theology. Because many times, here's what happens, especially in the New Testament. The local church goes through something, and so the apostles or the pastors would choose certain scriptural texts to address certain issues. Now, I'm not saying that NCC is going through all of these issues, but we're going to address the most potential relevant issues that we may come across as a church all right and lastly the gospel principles might feel or seem stretched let me remind you lang ha there's only there's always only one interpretation but with many implications applications and even inferences okay are we ready all right so we're going to summarize the whole book of ruth in three minutes or less uh, just to think about it this way there was a dude, his name was Elimelech. He was married to Naomi. Naomi had two sons, Malon and Kilion, which meant sickness and death, or sick and dying. <laughs> so imagine the kids' names, no? So um, it was during the time of the judges, so God was disciplining Bethlehem, his people. They couldn't take the famine, they left. They left, his two sons married two Moabite women, Ruth and Oprah, or, or, Orpa, Orpa. And then, sadly, all the men die. The only people left were the three ladies. Of the three ladies, uh, Orpa went back home. Ruth stayed with Naomi and they went, to, they went back to Bethlehem. In Bethlehem, they needed food. Ruth said, I'm going to go gather some food. I'm going to do what the law states, which is to glean behind the, the people who are... Who are uh, in the fields uh, she just so happened to arrive at the field of a guy named Boaz she gleaned there Boaz was so blessed by her loyalty and everything she's done for Naomi that Boaz extended kindness affection grace compassion and favor so because of that a friendship probably developed and Naomi decided you know what this guy is a redeemer we should get this ball rolling with the whole redemption plan so Ruth chapter 3 um, Ruth went to Boaz to the threshing floor and uh, they discussed they had a DTR define the relationship uh, eventually uh, in chapter 4 finally Boaz redeems Ruth the whole story now we're going to focus on a few verses in Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 to 5 it says it, it says very specific things. In chapter 1, is, verse 1 especially, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to Sohorn or Sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife 
and his two sons. Focus on that phrase, a man of Bethlehem. You know what this means? It means that Elimelech was not only a Jew, but he knew about Yahweh. Not only that, he was known by the people. He was a man of Bethlehem. If atua pa today, this is a guy who grew up in Sunday school. This is someone who was sikat in youth ministry. This is someone who uh, the, the ministers knew about. So it's a popular kid in church who grew up, they probably even celebrated his wedding. Uh, they probably knew about everything that he's done his entire life. It's like that. But then when the famine hit, he left. He decided to go to a churchless place called Moab. Many times we do the same thing. When we don't like God's ways, we often choose ungodly functional saviors. And this hits home. When we don't like God's ways, we often choose ungodly, functional saviors. We have an issue, we think it's legit, so we find ways to address those needs, those felt needs. What are some examples of those? Many times, when we think of our money, our salary, our career, we go abroad. Like my story earlier with my friend. We go to churchless cities. When we are lonely or we just want to settle down, many times we choose unbelieving partners or we decide. Or what about this? It's so inconvenient to do business in a corrupt government. Shortcut na lang. Business shortcuts. What about schoolwork? It's so much pressure. So to relieve ourselves of the pressure, ano na lang? We look side to side for information. What about work? When there's so many things that happen in work and we feel so much pressure, we tend to lie. Or when we just want to get a quick fix, we use get-rich-quick schemes. The problem is we're often blind to future consequences of our ungodly decisions. We never really count the real cost. When we go to churchless cities, we think we'll get money, we end up with spiritual death. When we think that we'll be happy with unbelieving partners, we end up having usually unbelieving in-laws, like Elimelech, right? And uh, according to that friend of mine, the person suffered depression, suicidal thoughts. This person was not someone who struggled with depression. But because of that, I, I thought of killing myself many times. I didn't know what to do anymore, all of that. We think that a business shortcut would give us convenience. Instead, it leaves us in bondage and we are vulnerable to blackmail from the government. You paid us before, we expect you to pay us again. Every renewal of the business permit, there will be the under the table thing. We think cheating in school will help us pass quickly, but it ruins our mindset and we're self-sabotaging ourselves for the future. We think that lying in work will relieve us from pressures, but this becomes a lifestyle. And then we begin to wonder if we're really Christian at all. The get-rich-quick get schemes often make us bankrupt. We know the story of Kappa. Because God's discipline is always present. The Bible does say it clearly. He who wants to get rich quick or wants to get rich hastily will not escape God's punishment. Proverbs. Many times, here's actually what happens. We go through desperation and we struggle with our devotion. That is the big struggle. So what should we do? I'm desperate. I want to remain devoted. I'm stuck in the middle. What's the solution? The solution, oftentimes, does not lie in just ourselves. It doesn't lie in just ourselves. In Ruth chapter 2, Verses 11 to 16. This is already the time when Ruth arrived in the field, okay? And uh, Boaz was giving her a lot of grace, told her, hey, don't go into other fields. You know, you might get hurt, you might get harmed. Stay here. We'll watch over you and protect you and all of that. And Ruth said, why have I found favor in your sight? I'm a foreigner. You don't owe me anything. I'm a Moabite. 
And Boaz answered, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. What was Boaz doing? He acknowledged that he was part of the community that God had given to Ruth. And he decided that he would be part of God's redemptive plan for her. So he saw that Ruth was desperate, but he also saw that Ruth was struggling with being devoted. And so as part of Ruth's community now, Boaz helped. The solution to the, the dilemma between desperation and devotion is not isolation. It's not to go at it alone. The solution is to entrench yourself deeper in the community of faith that God has given you. And we as a community have to help. We should help. When you're in church especially, now this is just once a week, guys. Sundays, focus on how can I be a blessing to others? How can I help others? It's not the time to uh, I'll just go listen. Nah, human ako, I'm done. But I got my fix. Good sermon. I'll just find ways to apply it within the week. No, apply it now. Apply it today, this Sunday. Do it. Look around. There are people who will need help. There are people who will need prayer. Talk. If you have the opportunity to help, then help. Practical love is important. Prayer is good, but prayer should be accompanied with proactiveness. Interestingly, look at what Boaz said. Boaz said, the Lord repay you. But he didn't stop there. The Lord repay you. Stay here, I'll help. He didn't say, the Lord repay you. Now go and do your thing and let's just hope nga God will really do his thing too. No, the Lord repay you through me. That's what Boaz tried to do. Because we as Christians also know that faith without works is dead. When we pray for others but not actually do practical love, prayer is faith. Prayer is faith. When we pray but don't act on our prayers, that's dead faith. If you can help, help. Boaz not only did that, but he also used his influence and authority to lead and guide others in how to show grace. He told his young men, don't lay a hand on her, watch over her, protect her. You know, do what you can. He used whatever resources was given to him by God, his influence, his leadership, his authority. He used all of it to try to extend more grace, more compassion, more love, more practical help to those who are struggling between desperation and devotion. We have to be proactive. When Boaz told the people, don't reproach her for gleaning, that's passive. That's passive. And then Boaz added, in fact, leave bundles for her intentionally, proactive. So both. He really thought about what he could do. The problem is that it's almost a default for us to find justifications for not helping others. We look for those justifications. Now let me give a qualifier here. I'm not saying, we're not saying that we should enable the bad habits of others. That's not what we're saying. But when we see that a person is struggling between devotion and desperation, and there are no bad habits, the person's really struggling hard. It just so happened that life hit. We should not look at their past. We should not look at their mistakes anymore. But we should ask this question. What is God doing in their life right now? How can I compliment in that area? As elders of churches, as pastors, it's a little bit more relevant for us, especially during crisis counseling, conflict resolution, and all that. And we see that someone might be a little um, angry or hard-hearted and all of that. We always need to pause as elders or counselors and ask, Lord, what are you doing in this person's life? What are you doing in his life? What are you doing in her life? How can we complement in that area? Should we be stern, firm? Should we be gracious, compassionate? What, what should we do? And that's where all of us should think that way too. See, showing practical love 
can also be risky. And this is a problem. We live in a world filled with cruelty, apathy, selfishness, and just depraved. We live in a fallen world. And in this fallen world, practical love, especially with, between opposite sexes, can be so quickly interpreted as romantic love. Agree? And you're all thinking, ay, ay. Again, ha? Huh? We're talking about what is most potentially relevant for our church today. And, you know, we look at around, we look, we look at each other, a lot of singles. Okay? So... And Ruth and Boaz was also a romantic love story. So we have to address this. Practical love is so quickly interpreted as romantic love because of three reasons. First, worldly mindsets. We all came from the world. We all thought about the Hollywood version of love. And so when we come to church, we're not used to pure, godly compassionate, practical love between opposite sexes. So we assume, we open the door for me. Nanguyab ay, ha? Huh? Grabe. Inana ba? I'm, I'm exaggerating of course. But you know what I mean. Nitabang lang gamay. I think he's making moves. You know? Ano ba yan? The second one is worldly influences. When you allow yourself to be influenced by your friends who are of the world, you talk to Christian friends. Don't ask counsel from friends who are not biblical. Not just Christian friends, but biblically knowledgeable, biblically mature friends. Okay? Okay, ang uban, mga o Christian, but kana pong Christian, Christian. So, lisod ka na. That's dangerous. Third, deceitful hearts. We have many hopes that turn into hurts because of this issue. So what are some practical things we can do? There are three don'ts that I would always give. First, don't assume. For both men and women, both men and women, can I be men assuming put? Okay? So on both sides, don't assume. If walay giingon, don't think about it. Okay? If the guy or the girl doesn't say anything, maski pa actions are so murag ano, if you're uncomfortable na, then just don't hang out. Balibad lang. Say no thanks. Or you just say, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable because you're a little bit too familiar with me. You're a little too forward. You're a little too playful. You just say it straight. You're a little too touchy. Say it straight lang, but never assume. Second, please don't tease. Oi, si ano? Oi, hala oi, nakilig ko. Alright, just don't tease. Just stop that. Third, don't flirt. It's so tempting to flirt. Just avoid it. If we really analyze it, Boaz probably did not even expect anything from Ruth. We talked about this last week. Remember, number one, he was hashtag daughter zone. Diba? <laughs> So he's probably thinking, why would Ruth choose me? I'm old enough to be her father. Secondly, she's a widow part one. If I die because of old age, my widow part two siya. I'm going to end up ruining her prospect for future security. She'll probably not choose me. Thirdly, they're young men. The barley season just finished. In other words, the young men have money. In other words, sweldo na. So these young men... And if Ruth was lovely, these young men would probably think of her in that way. So I'm probably the last person who should hope to be with Ruth. So he probably did not even think about it. And lastly, he wasn't the closest redeemer, Pagyud. And he knew it. Rather, he simply kept his blamelessness, he kept his integrity, and he continued to obey the Lord. He was pure and proper the entire time. Just be that. Now look at 3 verse 11. This was already during the time when Ruth was at the threshing floor. Remember the scene? So after everything, Naomi said, Hey Ruth, you 
put on some, put on maybe some makeup, put some perfume, remove your morning clothes, morning, the hila-hila clothes, not early morning, okay? Remove your morning clothes and wear something nice and then go to the dude, but wait till he's asleep when he's had his fill and then have the DTR talk. When they finally uh, had the talk, look at what Boaz said. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And in verse 14, it says there, So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. We shouldn't let people know that you came here. Why? What's the issue here? If we really think about it, Ruth, Boaz, and Naomi all behaved properly and purely. They all behaved properly and purely. Some think that Naomi wanted Ruth to seduce Boaz. Desperate moves ba? You know, seduce the guy. Hopefully, um, he'll give in and then he's going to be forced to marry you. There's so much reason to believe that that is a wrong interpretation. Here's why. First, Naomi loved Ruth and did not want to endanger her. The entire time, Naomi just looked out for Ruth's well-being and safety. And then suddenly go and get raped? That's not characteristic of Naomi. Secondly, Ruth and Naomi probably talked about Boaz a lot. I mean, for the whole barley harvest, Ruth would come home always bringing food. So Naomi would always be like, again, so much food? Again, so much? Why? Si Boaz ay. Oh, what happened today? Ah, grabe lagi. He gave me this, he gave me that. In fact, napa extra, really? And the following day, again. Oh, food again? Ay, najud hawat diha day. Okay, so there's so much chica that's happening between the two of them. In other words, Naomi, through the chica moments probably already knew so much about Boaz's character. She also knew or thought at the time in her mind that Boaz was the Redeemer. If Boaz was already showing so much kindness and is the Redeemer, there's no need for seduction here. What, what else for? Obvious nay. Okay? Thirdly, the Bible actually calls Boaz a noble man. The Bible itself, the author, already says it. The finishing the har- so the issue on the finishing the harvest season simply meant that Boaz would now have the funds to redeem or purchase the estate of Elimelech. Why not sooner? Because harvest season naman. Now you have the funds, now you have profits, now you can redeem the estate. Nah, not before. Also, going to the threshing floor privately was to honor Boaz for, when asking for a request. It's not, oy, pa secret niha para maseduce. That's not the point. Again, remember, during this time when the, thresh, the threshing floor was not empty, there are probably men sleeping in the threshing floor also to guard the produce because obviously they also have a cut there. So the men will sleep somewhere around the area to prevent thieves and, and kanang pilferages ba? Okay, so it's so unlikely for something to happen with several men in the area sleeping. Men who Boaz himself tasked to watch over and protect Ruth. So why in private? Why this way? Because asking him publicly would publicly would have been improper, discourteous, and ungrateful. Imagine you entrap the guy, the one who helped you been gracious to you, courteous, courteous to you, generous to you, you ask him in public for a huge favor, use all your profits from this barley harvest and buy Elimelech's estate and us too. Oh, and you have to take care of us for the rest of our lives. And then you ask that in front of everyone? Dili pwede. That's, that's so ungrateful. So it was better done in private. And before, the only way to do that was for Ruth to come at night in private because there was no chat. There was no text or email. Okay, so that's the only choice they had. The uncovering of the feet, 
is a Jewish act of service and submission, not seduction, according to their culture. And lastly, we see Boaz as a redeemer who in all, for all intents and purposes, the author of the book of Ruth wanted to show how we can rely on our redeemer to not hurt us. So why would, we, why would people interpret it this way, na seduction and Boaz was probably going to take advantage? It's not like that. All right? So we just want to help you see a clearer picture of the interpretation of chapter 3. So they all honored and protected each other and even the witnesses around them from stumbling. So they honored self, they honored each other, they honored others who saw. What are some samples for us today? Now, qualifier, these are not rules. We're not trying to be legalistic. But here are just a few examples for all of us today so at least we can see practical ways on how to honor ourselves, each other, and one another. Just some random thoughts. For example, eating together alone. Especially if you're married, you're eating with someone who's not your spouse of the opposite sex. What if nagkataon lang? It still can be a little suspicious. So we avoid that. Where you sit in cars matter. Me being married, Rainy and I have a rule. No lady sits in front. So sit in the back. If wala si Rainy, and then there are women, they all sit in the back. If there are men, the men sit in the front. That's it. The only exception is if grabi ang bagyo and there's a typhoon or whatever. Okay, fine, sige. But if dili, sorry, take a taxi na lang or I don't know, text us when you get home or sit in the back. If you're not boyfriend, girlfriend, if let's say the, the one driving is a guy, you're a lady, you're not uyab, don't sit in the front. Look for a guy, bro, ikaw sa front para tapad mong duha. So it doesn't look like you're the girlfriend or vi vice versa. Be careful with those things because it might look suspicious to others. Private chats, late nights, okay? Those are, uh, and we've said this before, I'll just rem it's just a reminder. Private chats are actually dates. What is a date? A date is an uh, exclusive private world with just the two of you, right? To get to know each other more. So a private chat is a date, in a sense. Might be unintentional, might be accidental, but a date is a date. And if it happens all the time, careful lang. Teasing and matchmaking. Now, many of you don't tease each other. Or don't tease others. You don't go, bagay kay mo. But there's another kind. Bagay kay sila, know what you guys think. Be careful of that too. You know why? When that happens, okay? When that happens, you're actually influencing the minds of others na. Now what if dili sila? What if it's not them? What if God prepared someone else? People whose minds have been conditioned would go, "I it's not ano di I? I was hoping for this. Plot twist lagi ni. I don't like this plot twist." And so people cannot genuinely rejoice. So avoid that. We're innocent of the first one, many of us can be guilty of the other. So even with Rainy and I, when we talk, both of us, we go, Han, no, Han, no. What do you think? No, don't, just don't go there. We're not going there at all. And we don't. So be careful with your conversations. What if she, ano, what if she, inani? You know, the problem with singles, you talk to the person, what if she, ano, and then that other single will think, oh, bitaw, no, but in her mind, sana ako. <laughs> what if, ingun, ana? <laughs> What if the person is interested? Patay! Now, as friends, oh, I cannot ano anymore. If ever gani ako gani na, I can't rejoice. Because... You see how it works? Just be careful. How about this? They're already coupled, uyab, or a little bit obvious. And then people go, Oh, really? Kamu na? Pag minyo na mo, say dugayan. Go, go. Go lang ng go. That's also something we have to be careful about. You know why? You don't know what they're going through. You don't know if they've gone through counsel. You don't know if they have issues. You don't know if they're not supposed to even be together. 
Alright? So don't just advise them. Minyo na mo. Instead, ask, have you gone through counseling? How, how are you guys as a couple? How are your spiritual disciplines as a couple? Are you praying together? Are you praying for each other? You know, all of those things. So you guys don't know what people are going through. So be very careful with that. Many times, our good intentions can lead us to very, very dangerous comments. You see it? Just as Ruth and Boaz were very careful to honor each other and one another and the whole church, or I'm sorry, the whole community in their context, so us church, we have to be aware as well. I'm not saying, hala, niabot ko early sa, sa church center, niya niabot siya, opposite sex, mahawa ko. <laughs> we're not talking about, that's grab legalistic na pun, no? Uh, we're, so we're not saying that you should obey these rules. What We're, we're just looking at the principles ba? Okay? Just the principle. So, it's up to you how you want to apply those things. Alright? Now we move forward. And then later we'll look at the macro view and look at the gospel good from the whole book of Ruth. Look at Ruth verse 3. Ah, sorry. Chapter 3, verse 10. When Ruth had the DTR with Boaz, Boaz said, okay, you know what? Before that, I'm sorry, I'll just backtrack a little bit. It's a story I'd like to share. I've shared this before, but it might be really good. Um, when I was starting out as a Christian, I was discipled by a guy named Japes. You guys know him because I use him a lot, or I mention him a lot. But this guy was ve really very serious with the whole community, holiness thing. And one day he gathered all of us men together in a Bible study. It was in Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf in Makati. So he gathered us all together and he said, guys or men, let's have a culture as men. Here's what we, we can do. Let's honor the ladies while we're all singles so that when we get married in the future, there will be no issues. Let's, because I don't know who's going to marry who. I don't know if this lady will become your wife or bro, if you're going to marry that lady. We don't know that. So I'm going to protect all of the ladies as your potential future wives. So I'm doing you a favor as a brother to a brother as early as now. And we had that culture. You know what? He finally got married. During the reception, he called us. There were like seven of us. And then we, were, we locked arms together. Agbay, bitaw sa shoulder. We were doing this. We were huddled in the, uh, in the back of the projector screen during the reception. And then he said, Brothers, I just want to thank you. Because while... My wife and I were still single. All of you protected her, honored her, watched over her, watched over me. During our courtship, you guys held me accountable. You held me transparent. And right now, she and I are married. And she has no issues with any one of you. And none of you have issues with her or me. Thank you. That to me. And, and then he says, this is the greatest wedding gift that we have received that is something that I hope we can have here. Let's honor one another. Let's watch out for each other. How interesting or how weird or sad if people would get married and go, yeah, hon, I'm not so comfortable hanging out with so-and-so because diba, you guys were dating and things got a little weird and a lot of things. Just avoid that. Let's just avoid it. Now look at chapter 3, verse 10. He said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. So what was Boaz saying? You didn't go after all these other dudes who are younger, who can probably keep you secure for a longer time because they're not as old as I am. So that's one way of interpreting it. Another way of saying it is this. Your first kindness was you were loyal to Naomi. She's old, she's a widow, and you were there for her. Now, you are willing to get married to me, someone who's old, just so that Naomi is also redeemed through you. So you're thinking so selflessly that you're thinking of allowing yourself to marry for the sake of Naomi? So it's a double kindness that Ruth is showing. Kindness to Boaz, Kindness to Naomi the first time. Kindness to Naomi now a second time. We did talk about this last week, that Boaz felt undeserving. 
even after everything he did for them, and rightly so. The problem with the world today is we look at Hollywood. And when we look at Hollywood, we watch those movies and we say, oh, of course, dapat ma sila. Because number one, sila ang starring sa movie. And number two, after everything he's done for her? Diba that's usually the case? You know, he rescued her from the tower and slayed the dragon and got hurt in the process. Of course, she should marry him. There's this talk about deservingness. The worth that we have. But Boaz understood what, it, what the gospel really says. No matter how much you do for another person, you will never, ever, ever deserve the loyalty of someone for the rest of his life or her life until you both die. Nobody deserves that. And because no one deserves that, he understood. He said, may you be blessed by the Lord. He saw himself as undeserving. Now look at Ruth on the other hand. Ruth's standards changed. Her standards as a Moabite, worldly, believer as a Moabite, was young, coming from a healthy family. Diba? Look at Elimelech, rich guy, Elimelech. Two sons coming from Bethlehem. Famine now, but they have land, future asset, some worldly standards. Now, look at, her, look at Ruth's standards. It changed. Doesn't matter if he's kind of older than me. Doesn't matter if uh, it's a risk that I'm willing to take. Here's the thing. He's godly. He's godly. And because he's godly, it's a good match for me. Many of us have to change some of our standards. When I was a very young Christian, I had such ungodly standards. God, I want a spouse who's the following. And then there's a list. And usually that list is very, very secular, very quote-unquote practical. Practical line nani. And then I had this, I heard about this prayer and I dared to pray it. I said, Lord, either answer my prayer or change my heart. And here's what God did. I'm not talking about the Pentecostal version, huh? but in terms of just being convicted by the word through prayer, I had, a, I had a literal checklist in my prayer journal. I'm not even kidding. It's an, I want, there's a list. And I went through them one by one, and God made me examine my heart. Why do you want a girl who's like this? Okay, Moni, uy, worldly. Why do you want a girl who's like this? Because of Mona. Uy, worldly again. Uy, worldly again. And I started to realize I was so worldly. My standards were so secular, so I had to crush them all out. And then I was left with nothing. I said, Lord, now what? What do you want from me? Or what should I want? And then I started reading scripture, and then I saw Ruth, and I studied the character of Ruth, and I was so impressed. And then I read Proverbs, and I saw, Lord, I'm so ungodly. And when my standards changed, and I was praying for those standards to happen huh, for about six years. When I finally changed those standards and I said, okay, Lord, I have new standards now. I want my future spouse to be all of that. Now I, I wrote down verses. I wrote down all the verses. And in the end, um, about two months after that was when I met Rainy. So it, I'm, I'm not saying, anuha. all I'm saying is God... In, in the sovereignty of God, God answers prayers. Okay, so I'm. Kamo ba? Ayom mo ano ha? All right. Because you guys were. Okay, relax lang. But all I'm saying is just as God is sovereign over Ruth, God is sovereign over all of us. And I can testify to that. And so can you. We have to have faith from desperation to devotion. Now we'll have to go through a little bit of hashtag real talk because it's a real concern. Many times we're so tempted to look for unbelievers as partners. And here's the thing. In small churches with many singles, it's really an issue because our standards can get challenged. And it's a struggle for both men and women, but real talk lang, it's mostly a struggle for women than men. Why? Because number one, there's what we call a biological clock that women think of. 
Secondly, women are the one pursued, not men. I mean, diba? Just logically, so you don't want to be tempted, but the guy keeps texting you, keeps calling you. You block that number, he gets a different SIM card, you text you with that SIM card, you block the, ano, this Facebook account, they'll just make a new account. Hi, hello, hi, hello. Samuk ba? And, you know, like water hitting rocks, over and over and over again, that rock will erode. And so women struggle with this more. Plus, you've got social media, the access, just the accessibility of, you know, communication. Let me say something. I've been in ministry for 15 years. That's one and a half decades. And I've counseled so many. And you know what I noticed? The excuses are always the same. Guys, I, I'm not even exaggerating. It's as if they have a script and then they just let the next person borrow the script. Oh, ikaw na, humana ko, your turn. Oh, you want to go with an unbeliever? Here's the script for all the excuses. It's exactly the same. Let me read to you the top eight that I've heard over and over again. Top eight. Number one, he or she is open to going to church, supportive of my faith, attends Bible study groups, and even getting discipled. Okay? Bro, she's really interested. And I saw her cry one time during a Bible study. You know, they sincerely and genuinely want to please you, not God. Men are capable also of so many feats and accomplishments just to convince women. So it's both. We've had someone who even became a member of the church just to impress a girl that he liked. Imagine, huh? And you guys know how difficult it is to be an NCC member. You guys know how tiring it can be. Giantos tanan. Para sa love. But since wala ma hitabo, wala ma uyab, ah, wa, quit. I know someone and we've counseled them. The guy even said to me, Bro, maybe I should become a pastor. And I'm like, You're not even Christian. <laughs> For a while, I didn't say it out loud. And I'm like, Why do you want to be a pastor? Because my girlfriend wants me to be, a, to be you know, godly and all of that. And the godliest thing I can be is a pastor. So, guys, men are capable of feats and bounds to impress women and vice versa two this is usually the woman talking about the man he is nice good sweet responsible mature financially stable and he's better than most christian men i know okay according to whose standard that's the question is his heart regenerated by god if it's not, he's not better than Christian men. You're still dating a spiritually dead person, period. I'm sorry, but that's truth. Here's another one. What about all the success stories I've heard? Oh, see, so and so man lagi, my parents man lagi, my uncle man lagi, Christian and non-Christian, okay man lagi ang marriage. You've heard that? Here's the thing. Two things. First, what about the tragic stories? Have you ever heard of the tragic stories? The adulteries, the annulments, the divorces, the kaliwaans, the kanans. Grabe. And second, maybe you're choosing the stories that will agree with you. You're just looking for it. You're choosing ba para you feel better about your decision. Third, I'm sorry, fourth, I'm just so tired, I'm just so lonely, enough is enough. I just want to be with someone according to whose timetable. Now you're saying, God, you see all of time, but you should submit to my timetable. That's really what you're saying. Number five, you know, I'm not really unequally yoked yet. Okay, it's not official. We'll only be yoked when I say yes. Or if nanguyab na ko and yes na ko, that's the only time we're unequally yoked. So right now, I'm not really unequally yoked. Let me say two things. First, let's define yoking. Yoking is a heart issue. It's not a title. It's not a change status on Facebook. It's a heart issue. Once you can no longer not consider the person, you're already yoked. When you're already thinking this way, if manguyab siya na ko, Mo consider jud kuniya. 
you're already yoked. When you say, if ever gani, she shows signs that she's interested in me and manguyab kuniya, and she says yes, I'll accept that yes. It hasn't happened yet, but you're already considering it, you're already yoked. In the same way that when you're considering to sin, seriously, and you've already decided in your heart that if the opportunity comes, I will grab it, you've already sinned. Not in the future, you're sinning now. Remember, Jesus said, he who, it, you have heard it said, he who murders, who kills, is a murderer, but now I say unto you, if you just hate your brother, and so the heart is the issue. You're already yoked here. The change in the Facebook status, that just reveals what's already there. How about this? It's easy for you to say, you're not single like me. <laughs> I heard my friend say this to me before. I said, bro, I wasn't born married. <laughs> okay? I know what you're going through. It's, I know it's easy for me to say now because I'm married, but it wasn't always the case. Okay, so I get it. Number seven, how could you judge her? You don't even know her. You don't know how nice she is. You don't know that, that she's doing so many good things. Now, I, this actually happened. I'm not proud of it. I was a very young Christian. I didn't know how to counsel yet. So how could you judge her? I was like, bro, I'm not judging her. I'm judging you. <laughs> he got angry. I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said it. You know, I regretted it the moment I said it. But it's true, man. You know, here's the thing. She's not the one who's professing to be Christian. It's you. So you have to be the one to obey the standards of Scripture, not her. Here's the last one. The worst one. Bro, I can take the consequences whatever they will be. And I asked him, what consequences are you expecting? And she, you know, a little hardship here and there, a little this, a little that. I'm like, bro, don't forget. Sin will always make you pay more than you were willing to pay. It will drag you farther than you're willing to go. And in the end, you're going to regret it. And you know what he said? Bro, I respect you as a brother, but I, I disagree. Got married, good. And then called me up. Bro, please pray for me. Why? I don't know what to do. I feel suicidal all the time. I'm depressed. I got what I wanted, but now I realize it's not what I wanted. The I, um, uh, what did he say? One, one, one word really struck me. Oh, he said this. I don't know if I'm going to heaven or hell because I don't even know if I'm saved now. And even if she becomes a genuine Christian, I don't know if I am. Because even if she gets saved, how will I know if I'm saved because she got saved or I'm not really saved because there was a point in my life where I knew that I could risk my faith in God and I said yes to that risk. I, and then he said to me along the lines of, I wish in some weird way, I wish I would get persecuted and tortured and not deny the faith. At least I know I'm saved. Do you want that struggle? That's dangerous. Bottom line is this. You're not thinking in terms of sin or obedience. You're thinking in terms of pragmatism. You've created your own standard for what it means to be Christian. And you have become just like the LGBT Christians who've created their own standards as well. When you exchange your relationship with Christ, with idolatry, you have already stepped into a very dangerous area. And let me give you just this simple example. If there's a man who's married and you see him dating a girl who's not his wife and you start to talk, and he says this, Bro, I'm still faithful. Why? Nothing happened between us yet. Yet. Oh, but it, remove the yet. Nothing be happened between us. We just have dinner from time to time as friends, ba? And then I'm unfaithful? Grabby. So judgmental. Diba? Now, where do you draw the line? Of faithfulness and unfaithfulness? Is it, is it in the heart fantasizing? Is it the text? Is it the chat? Is it the dinner? 
Is it something happens? And I kid you not, I've heard someone say this. A guy told us, I'm still faithful. And something already happened, huh? like they slept together and then everything. I said, how can you say you're faithful to your spouse when you've slept with? And here's the answer. Because bro, in the end, I still go home to my spouse. I still provide for my spouse. I still bring money to the table. So as long as, look at the standard. He created his own standard. As long as I go home to that house, go home to that woman, and give money to that woman, I'm still faithful. He created his own standards. Here's the truth. If you don't value your marriage to Christ, then you will be willing to risk losing it. Because deep down, we all know this, you only risk what you consider disposable. If you date unbelievers, you're risking your relationship to Christ. You're saying your relationship to Jesus is disposable. That's the truth. Now look at Ruth 4 verse 15. Now we're going to go macro. Okay, we're going to go macro. And why did we go hard on those issues? We're going hard again because small church, lots of singles, most or mostly singles. All right. And so these are the potential, potential issues that we might go through as a church. So this is more prevention is better than cure. Ba? Okay. Ruth 4 verse 15, it says, He shall be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. What's he saying here? He's saying, or the author of the book, is saying that God redeems. Whatever you're going through, God redeems. Earlier, we talked about unequal yoking. And this isn't just relationships, okay? It's whatever you yoke yourself to that's not good, not right. You could get into business with a, with a non-believer and that person has majority in shares or something and decides how to do things and you're stuck. All those, all those unequal yokes. A yoke is simply something that forces you to go where the other person's going. That's a yoke. It could be a financial yoke, an emotional yoke, a psychological yoke, a relational yoke. So many different yokes. The thing is, God warns us against that. In 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14, it says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And look at the application. God doesn't say, therefore, evangelize to them, bring them to church, and let's hope they get saved through you. That's not in the Bible. You know what the Bible says? Therefore, go out from their midst, be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, then... I will welcome you. What's the implication? As long as you're together, I'm not welcoming you. That's the implication. You choose your sin, I will not choose you. You stay with them, you don't get to stay with me. Same with the marriage. Wouldn't you agree? You watch good those movies, good those crazy third-party films, especially the Pinoy films. Pumili ka, shao ako. It's never... Okay, you can choose the other person. I'll just be here waiting for you lang gihapon. I'll still... No. It's always, you make a choice. We know that to be true because that's biblical too. And then he says, Then I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. In other words, if you choose your sin, I'm no father to you. You're no child of mine. Because you're living in sin. First John says it, remember? He who says that he lives in the light but walks in darkness is a liar. The truth is not in him. It's a living in sin issue. It's an unrepentance issue. But God will show grace. There's hope. The hope is that when we obey God, when we allow God to work in our lives, when we say, Lord, this is difficult for me, I'm, I'm desperate, but I want to stay devoted, entrench yourself deeper in a community of faith and allow them to speak into your life. Dili pwedeng help me, help me, so I can continue with my sin. It's not like that, huh? 
And as a community of faith, we shouldn't just always go, oh, nag-struggle, magood na siya, sige, sabton lang forever. No, it has to be addressed. Dude, what are you doing, bro? Bro, let's talk one-on-one. I'm concerned for you and your faith. Please, reconsider what you're doing. You're sinning. Are you even saved, bro? We pray for each other. We warn one another. We have to do that. And because of the obedience, look at the reward. God, in His sovereignty, redeemed all of them. God redeemed Ruth. God redeemed Naomi. God redeemed Boaz. The sovereignty of God is the primary focus here now. Let us not be like Elimelech who left Bethlehem. So to go back, when we don't like God's ways, we often choose ungodly, sinful, functional saviors and are blind to the future consequences of our sinful decisions. And this is precisely why, as a community, we should really help one another. Someone is obeying God, doing things to honor God, and struggling because of his obedience to God or her obedience to God. Atong tabangan. Don't kick them down. Don't say you just lack faith. Don't challenge them that way. Many times when we do that to someone obedient, when we say you just lack faith, our judgment of them lacking faith reveals our lacking love. So instead, love them. Support them practically. Encourage them. God is working in his life or her life to be obedient. How can I compliment that? How can I show that God rewards obedience through me? How, Lord? And we do it. Last week, we talked about calling one another accountable to the same standard of transparency that we ourselves must hold on to. Today, it's not only calling people to that same standard, but helping them live under that standard. Practical ways. Proactive mutual honoring and protection and love, compassion and grace. We gave tips today, but again, these are more principles. The bigger truth is that in verse 15, the baby in the arms of Naomi, that that baby, if you think about it, and you go New Testament mindset, the baby in the arms of Naomi, a forsaken woman, would one day lead to the Messiah, the restorer of life. The ultimate restorer of life. Last week, we talked about the sovereignty of God. We talked about how none of them expected a grander story that God could have prepared, but God did for his own glory, for his own purpose, and for our benefits. If God had a plan for them, God also has a plan for us. God also has us in his sovereign will. God also is mindful of us. And that should humble us. Remember King David who said, What is man, Lord, that you are mindful of him? But God is mindful of us. The enemy will always whisper things. Did God really say? Did God really say he will never leave you nor forsake you? Did God really say he's a redeemer? In this book, it's so interesting. And there are two points of interest in this book. You'll notice God is never mentioned by the author. The characters mention God. May the Lord redeem you. May the Lord bless you. The characters mention God, but the author never mentioned God. Why? It's brilliant in writing. The author wanted to show us that even in the events of your life, you can see God's hand at work. So yes, we see God work through Scripture, but we can also look at our lives and go, Lord, how are you working in my life? Open my eyes to the workings of your hands and let me praise you because of it. Use my life for your glory, Lord. Once we have that mindset, the obedience that we we want to give God becomes so much easier because trust will enter. Here's the other interesting point. Throughout the entire book, there's one word that's repeated over and over and over and over again. It's the word Moabite. Ruth, the Moabite, that Moabite woman, that foreigner Moabite, 
Who is that lady? Oh, it's the Moabite. Why is this word repeated over and over again? And you look at it, it's always, the Moabite Ruth received grace. The Moabite Ruth gleaned here and got lots of food. The Moabite was given affection and love. That is repeated over and over again, those two themes. The Moabite, undeserving, not supposed to get grace, not supposed to receive mercy, gets all of the good stuff without deserving it. That's a repetition of a very true gospel theme. For our case, we could say, the sinner, and then just put your name there, okay? the sinner blank received love, the sinner blank received the sinner, the sinner, the sinner, the sinner, received grace, mercy, love, compassion, forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, adoption, all of it. That is, a, that is the highlight of this book, to see that God is sovereign over our lives in a gracious way. Now look at Ruth. Now I'm going to backtrack. You know, in the Jewish way of writing, they kind of backtrack to the start. In Ruth 1 verse 21, and we're really going to end here. In Ruth 1 21, Ruth said this, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. This really jumped out of me, uh, jumped out to me when I was reading the text. Because when Ruth left, it was famine. It was such a bad famine that they named their son sick and dying. Malon and Kilian. It was that bad. Okay? But she said, I went away full. That famine, all the, the discipline that God was doing in my life, that was full. She considered the discipline of God full. Why? This reminds me of something that happened many years ago with my younger brother. He was less than 10 years old. Some of you have met him. Uh, he was very young and he was really funny because he was this little pudgy kid. And for some reason, he was getting disciplined by my dad. So my dad, I don't remember the issue, but my dad was telling him, you know, like you disobeyed some of the rules of the house. Because of that, money, mona. And my younger brother, like maybe eight years old, he was like, I don't like this house, oi. I don't like all, any of you. He got so angry. <laughs> you know when we're kids, we're like maglayas nako. He got his basketball and a loaf of sliced bread. Like the whole loaf. He started marching out the gate with a basketball and a loaf of bread. Then at the end of the gate, he suddenly stops. And you could just, like we're all watching, be, 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 mugawas ba tanahon be, let's see. Then he gets to the gate and then he stops. He turns around marches back to us and he goes I won't leave na lang uy and then he goes into the house just sulks in the corner and I know it sounds cute it sounds funny it's hilarious even to really meditate on that event but here's what he realized no matter how strict how painful the discipline of the house it's still so much better compared to the lack of the father's love outside the house and that's true for all of us. Whatever perceived lack you think you have right now while you're with God, while you're obeying God, that is still an infinite fullness compared to actually losing God. So when it comes to desperation versus devotion, if you think of how God has given everything not withholding his son, his only son, to die on the cross for you and me. That alone is fullness. You're not going to think in terms of desperation and devotion. You're going to think in terms of waiting and knowing that God loves you. And because of that, you can stay devoted. That's really the message of Ruth. It might sound nice. It would be a great movie. Basalang Hollywood doesn't produce it. It has wonderful story. It's a wonderful story about love, romance, but really more than that, it's a story about God, the sovereignty of God, the grace that He pours out in their life, and how we can trust that He will pour out the same grace in ours. Amen? Let's pray.